You're leaving me? The words came out shaky as I stared at Trent, unable to process the bombshell he had just dropped. For who? Trent shifted uncomfortably. Her name is Lila. She's younger. More exciting than the tired routine we've fallen into. My heart felt like it had been ripped out of my chest. After fifteen years of marriage, countless sacrifices made for our family, this was how it ended? I was being left for some younger thing he had fallen for? Well, does she know about me, about us? I demanded through the tears welling up. Marla, please don't make this harder than it needs to be, Trent said, not meeting my eyes. I'm sorry, but it's over between us. I'll be moving in with Lila by the end of the week. With that, he turned and walked out, leaving me standing in the kitchen we had remodeled together just two years ago. I felt dizzy, nauseated, like I was trapped in a waking nightmare. The fallout was brutal over the next few days. Despite Trent's pleas to keep things private, word quickly spread through our social circles about his affair. I became the subject of pity and judgment from so-called friends. How could you not have seen the signs? He's just going through a midlife crisis. Maybe if you had kept yourself up better. The comments and whispers chipped away at my self-worth. I had given up so much for that ingrate, my career, my hobbies, my independence, all to be a devoted wife and mother to our teenage son. And this was how it ended, with me as the punchline to a sordid joke? No, I wouldn't accept that. Summoning what little resilience I had left, I dusted off my old passion, cooking. It had been my dream since I was a little girl to open a cafe, serving up home-style comfort food. While raising a family, I had let that aspiration fade away into the periphery. But not anymore. I may have lost my husband, but I wasn't going to lose myself in the process. Within a matter of weeks, I had tracked down an available property in town and begun renovating it into a cozy cafe space. My childhood friend Danny, one of the few who stood by me through the heartbreak, invested his savings to become my business partner. You sure about this, Marla? he asked one afternoon as we prepped the kitchen. Trent did a number on you. You don't need to prove anything. I shot him a determined look as I kneaded the dough. That's exactly why I need to do this, Danny. Trent doesn't get to dictate the terms anymore. This cafe is about taking control of my life again. I slapped the dough down with emphasis. He wants younger and more exciting? I'll show him exciting. Danny must have seen the fire in my eyes because he simply nodded in understanding. This cafe was more than just a business venture. It was my declaration of independence, my way of rising from the ashes of betrayal. On opening day, I showcased my talents with a menu featuring all my specialties. Chicken pot pies with buttermilk biscuit crusts, thick-sliced homemade bread pudding, and, of course, my famous double-fudge brownies. As the morning crowd began trickling in, I couldn't help but smile to myself. This was just the start of my reinvention. If Trent and his mistress thought they could take me down, they had another thing coming. The real Marla was just getting warmed up. The grand opening of Marla's cafe was a smashing success. From the moment we opened the doors, a steady stream of customers poured in, eager to sample my home-cooked specialties. This chicken pot pie is to die for, gushed Mrs. Robertson, a sweet elderly woman who quickly became one of my regulars. You've got to share the recipe with me, dear. I smiled politely. Secret family recipe, I'm afraid, but I'd be happy to bake an extra one for you next time. Across the diner, Danny was a whirlwind of motion, refilling drinks and clearing plates with the efficiency of a veteran server. Despite my initial hesitation over going into business with my oldest friend, he had proven himself an invaluable partner. His investment and tireless work made launching the cafe possible. As the lunch rush finally died down, Danny plopped down on the stool beside me at the counter. Who would have thought this place would be such a hit right out of the gates? I shot him a look. Please, like you had any doubts, this is Comfort City. The people here are starving for some good, hearty home cooking. Danny shrugged half-heartedly. I don't know, after everything with Trent and his little home wrecker, I worried this was too big a risk for your emotional state. The mere mention of Trent's name reopened the old wound. I gritted my teeth, hands clenching into fists beneath the counter. You mean after he took everything and left me with nothing? A few new nearby patrons looked over at my raised voice, but I didn't care. I was done putting on a brave face, pretending it didn't still cut me to the core. 
Danny at least deserved to see the truth. He didn't just abandon me, Danny, I said, seething. He took my dreams, my sense of identity, everything I had given up to support his career and put him first, fifteen years of sacrifices and what thanks did I get, traded in for some young tramp who caught his wandering eye. Danny put a comforting hand on my arm, but I shrugged it off, standing up abruptly. Well, I'll be damned if I let that bastard take one more thing from me. He wants to treat me like yesterday's garbage? Fine, but he's going to choke on the taste of how wrong he was about me. With that, I stormed into the kitchen, pulling the first rack of fresh bread from the oven. I viciously began slicing it, each slice a satisfying thwack against Trent's smug, unfaithful face. The yeasty scent of baked dough filled the air as I envisioned shoving handful after handful down his lying throat until he choked. I was so wrapped up in my fuming fantasy that I didn't hear the front door open. It wasn't until an all-too-familiar voice cut through my rage that I realized I had an audience. Well, if it isn't the little wifey who decided to play restaurant. I spun around to see Trent leaning against the counter, his infuriatingly casual posture grating every last nerve. Beside him stood a knockout blonde, easily fifteen years my junior, his new plaything, no doubt. "'Get out of my café,' I snarled, hurling a bread slice directly at his smirking face. It struck with a satisfying thwop, bouncing off his nose. Trent didn't even flinch, laughing it off as he brushed a few crumbs from his shirt. "'Is that any way to treat a paying customer, Pumpkin? We're just here to sample the sad little morning-after special.' That mocking sneer— the belittling tone, it was all I could do, not to leap across the counter and claw his eyes out right there. How dare he come into my place, my establishment, and try to make me feel small. Danny, get these pieces of shit out of my café, I growled. The altercation with Trent and his trollop left me shaken for days afterwards. I couldn't believe his audacity, swaggering into my café and trying to demean me like that. In my own establishment, no less. But I refused to let them rattle me for long. If anything, the confrontation only steeled my resolve to make Marla's café a success. This was my livelihood, my reputation on the line. I wouldn't allow Trent and his side piece to jeopardize that. And it seemed the rest of the community was squarely on my side, too. Word quickly spread about Trent's abhorrent behavior, turning public opinion firmly against him and his mistress. Suddenly, my café became a bastion for anyone who had faced a similar betrayal or failed relationship. It started with just a few customers, folks I remembered from past dinner parties or neighborhood gatherings dropping in to subtly check in on me. But then it snowballed into a daily parade of wronged women, and quite a few men too, all bonding over comfort food and intertwined tales of woe. Don't you worry about that sorry sack of manure, Agnes Northrup tutted in her southern drawl as she scraped the last bite of pecan pie from her plate. Her husband had run off years ago with his twenty-four-year-old secretary. Y'all got your pride and your pie, exactly what every good woman needs to survive a rat bag like that. I couldn't help but laugh at the old gal's colorful turn of phrase. You've got that right, Agnes. Pride, pie, and good company, that's the recipe for perseverance around here. With each new diner who sought refuge in my café's warm, welcoming atmosphere, I felt a rallying sense of purpose take root. These people, my new friends and neighbors, were all seeking the same thing I was—strength, comfort, and a reminder that we weren't alone. That we were, in fact, a community tied together by the shared struggle against heartbreak and betrayal. And Marla's café was the beating heart that nourished us, body and spirit. Order up! Danny's voice echoed from the kitchen window. I turned to see him plating up a fresh batch of biscuits and gravy, the very picture of confidence and efficiency. I mouthed a silent thank you his way, amazed at how seamlessly he had integrated into the café's daily operations. But I shouldn't have been surprised, really. After my entire world fell apart, Danny was the one constant, the only person who never wavered in supporting my idea to strike out on my own. Even when I had nothing left but a half-baked dream and a pile of emotional rubble, he believed in me. That kind of unconditional friendship was rarer than a perfect creme brulee. And it inspired me to pay that support forward to every person who walked through the café's doors. Which was how I found myself at the center of an unlikely new community. 
a ragtag group of divorcees, jilteds, and unlucky in lovers, all brought together by heartbreak and my famous loaded baked potato soup. We laughed over mimosas, swapped stories over plates of chicken and dumplings, and most importantly, started putting the pieces back together. Patty Evers, a new regular in her late fifties, said it best one afternoon as she soaked up the last bits of coffee with a glazed donut. You know, I came in here just looking for a nice cup of joe. She smiled wistfully around the table. But what I really found was a new lease on life. For the first time in years, I've got friends I can count on, and a home to come to when the days get long. I couldn't have summed it up better myself. Sure, the cafe was a business, but it was becoming so much more than that, too. A sanctuary, a gathering place, a community all its own. And I was the unlikely ringleader of this ragtag bunch of misfits. Who would have thought my own personal stumblings would have led me to a new beginning? A reminder that you can always rise again, stronger than before, if you just dig your heels in and refuse to be stamped out. As the ladies began clearing out and I headed for the kitchen to start prepping for dinner, I felt truly impossibly grateful for how far I'd come. This cafe was more than my dream realized. It was a triumph of the indomitable human spirit. Business at Marla's Cafe was booming. It seemed like every day brought new faces through the doors, word of our cozy little community hub spreading far and wide. I'd go home utterly spent after another busy lunch rush, but rejuvenated by the sense of camaraderie fostered within these walls. Little did I know, however, that my rattlesnake of an ex-husband was slithering around plotting something venomous. It started small, a few negative Facebook comments here and there alleging subpar sanitation or questionable ingredients. Annoying but nothing I couldn't ignore. This was just petty retaliation, Trent lashing out because I had managed to draw my own happiness from the ashes of our marriage. But then the anonymous complaints to the health department began trickling in, each more alarming than the last. Mrs. Wilkins, I'm afraid we've received multiple reports about rodent infestations and unsafe food handling practices at your establishment. A stern voice from the health inspector's office alleged over the phone. If these claims check out, I'll have no choice but to temporarily suspend operations until you get things in order. My mouth went dry as I clutched the receiver tight. Rodents? Food safety violations? That was ridiculous. I ran one of the cleanest, most careful kitchens in town. This had Trent's greasy fingerprints all over it. With all due respect, ma'am, I think those accusations are completely baseless, I said, struggling to keep my voice calm and even. My cafe follows all health codes to the letter. I would stake my reputation on it. There was a pause, then an audible sigh. Be that as it may, we have to investigate any claims brought to our attention lest an inspector will be by first thing tomorrow morning to look over your facilities. The dial tone buzzed in my ear as I slowly lowered the phone. An inspection? Based on outrageous lies, no doubt propagated by my scheming ex-spouse. He was actually trying to shut my new life down, all because he couldn't bear to see me happy and thriving without him. I slumped against the counter, struggling against the tidal wave of emotion, anger, sadness, indignation, all swirling together into one overpowering torrent. Just when I thought I'd righted the ship, rescued my independence from the wreckage of our imploded marriage, Trent appeared determined to try and capsize me all over again. Well, this time, I vowed as I gripped the countertop until my knuckles turned white, I wouldn't go down without a fight. If this was the way he wanted to handle things, I'd match his nastiness tenfold to defend everything I'd worked toward. The opening bell jingled jolted me back to the present. I looked up to see Danny striding purposefully toward me, polishing a glass with a dish rag as was his usual morning routine. All right, let's hear the special so I can— Marla? You okay? His brow furrowed with concern as he took in my shell-shocked expression. Did something happen? Slowly, I recounted the disturbing phone call from the health inspector. The insidious anonymous claims clearly meant to sabotage the cafe's reputation. As Danny listened, his expression morphed from confusion to outright disgust. That slimy, underhanded weasel, he snarled once I'd finished, slamming the glass down with such vehemence it nearly shattered. After everything Trent put you through, now he's trying to take away your business too? Screw that guy! He placed a reassuring hand on my shoulder. 
Don't worry, sis, we're not going to let that scumbag knock over all your hard work, you hear? If that rat liquor wants to play dirty, we'll show him just how down and dirty we can get, too. I felt a sad smile crease my face at Danny's impassioned reaction. For so long, I had to weather the storm of Trent's betrayal alone, keeping a brave face while the rest of the world gossiped and speculated. But here was Danny, as stalwartly in my corner as the day we'd opened, ready to defend our shared dream to the last. "'Thanks, Danny,' I said, giving his hand an appreciative squeeze. "'I don't know what I'd do without you.' He grinned mischievously. "'Good thing you'll never have to find out, partner. Now, what do you say we go make sure this place is spotless, even for those health bozos' insurmountable standards?' I chuckled at his tenacious attitude, feeling a fresh wave of determination crest inside me. Whatever obstacles Trent tried hurling in our path, we would plow right through them. After all, I had stopped letting that man dictate my life a long time ago, and I didn't plan on allowing him to start again any time soon. Despite Danny and I going over the café with a fine-toothed comb, the health inspector still arrived first thing the next morning— a pinched, severe-looking woman whose entire demeanor just screamed, by the book. "'Good morning, ma'am. I'm Inspector Diane Holcomb with the County Health Department,' she announced in a clipped, no-nonsense tone as I admitted her inside. Her eyes immediately narrowed in a scrutinizing gaze, sweeping dismissively over the café's charming decor and homestyle furnishings. "'I'll need to perform a full inspection based on the complainants we've received about unsanitary conditions here.' I bristled at her thinly-veiled implication. This place was my pride and joy, cleaner than a surgical ward. Just because we favored a cozy, comfortable ambiance over cold industrial minimalism didn't give this shirked hire the right to turn her nose up at my establishment. "'Be my guest, Inspector,' I said, trying to keep my voice polite through gritted teeth. "'I can assure you those complaints are completely unfounded.' Holcomb merely grunted dismissively already sweeping past me to begin prowling the dining room, scrutinizing every nook and cranny with a disapproving scowl. Behind the counter, Danny shot me a pointed look and rolled his eyes at the woman's blatant condescension. The next two hours were like something out of a fevered nightmare. Holcomb nitpicked and inspected every last square inch, from the spotless ovens and food prep surfaces to the, the immaculately cleaned floors and shelving units. I trailed in her wake, feeling my blood pressure spike with each new disapproving cluck of her tongue or shake of her head. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the insufferable woman clacked back behind the counter and dropped her checklist on the counter with an unceremonious thud. I braced myself, expecting a litany of write-ups and furious demands for corrective measures. "'Well, I can't find any violations whatsoever,' Holcomb said at last." not even attempting to mask her obvious displeasure. Guess those complainants were just blowing smoke. I nearly collapsed with relief right there. Danny, bless him, was less reserved, letting out a raucous, Woo-hoo! and pumping his fist victoriously. A few bewildered patrons turned to stare at the rowdy outburst. I told you those claims were baseless, I said, suddenly feeling emboldened and not caring if I came across unprofessional. Whomever lodged those gripes was clearly just trying to defame my business out of spite. Holcomb's expression soured further as her piggy eyes narrowed to slits. That's so? Well, I take claims of health violations very seriously. Mrs. Wilkins? I practically spat the name, unable to keep the venom from my tone. My ex-husband put you up to this ridiculous inspection, didn't he? The inspector recoiled slightly, clearly taken aback by my hostile confrontation. Around us, the cozy café atmosphere seemed to thicken with tension. Finally, Holcomb straightened her perpetually offended posture. "'I don't appreciate allegations of impropriety, Mrs. Wilkins. I'm simply doing my job in responding to claims filed with my office.' "'Oh, save the bureaucratic double-talk,' I scoffed, planting my hands squarely on my hips. "'We both know those claims were just a bunch of falsehoods concocted by my spiteful ex as an intimidation tactic.' At this, a hush fell over the café. All eyes turned expectantly toward the petty civil servant. Realizing she was surrounded, Holcomb flushed a deep crimson, though whether from embarrassment or indignation was unclear. "'Look, I don't care about your personal drama, lady,' 
she spat, suddenly looking very much like she wanted to crawl into a hole and disappear. All I can advise is documenting any unstable behavior from this EX and pursuing legal avenues for protection if needed. With that mortifying final salvo, the health inspector beat a hasty retreat, nearly sprinting out the front door without a backwards glance. The unbearable tension then shattered like a broken spell, and the café erupted in cheers and applause. You tell her, Marla. Give that worm-bitten punk what he deserves. I felt a sudden, overwhelming sense of community, of shared purpose and unbreakable solidarity. These people, my fellow divorcees and broken-hearted brethren, had my back. No questions asked. No hesitation. And at the eye of that powerful storm of support, I found myself even more determined than before. Trent wanted a war? He was going to get one, and there was no way in Hell's Half Acre I'd be backing down now. In the days following the disastrous health inspection, an uneasy calm settled over Marla's café. Trent had clearly taken a swing and missed with his sad attempt at sabotage. But I couldn't shake the feeling that he was simply regrouping, plotting out his next underhanded tactic to try and undermine my success. I should have known that worm wouldn't stay slithered under his rock for long. It was a Wednesday morning just after the breakfast rush had cleared out. I was in the back prepping for lunch service when Danny came bursting through the kitchen doors, eyes wild and chest heaving like he'd just run a marathon. Marla, you're not going to believe this, he sputtered breathlessly, thrusting his phone in my face. On the screen was a Facebook post, complete with video, that made my blood run cold. Disgusting health violations at Marla's Café. Rat feces found in kitchen and putrid, spoiled ingredients used. Do not eat here unless you want to get sick. The accompanying video showed a shaky, poor-quality recording inside what looked like our kitchen storage area. Panning slowly, it displayed grimy floors, a small patch of droppings in the corner, and weathered produce that had clearly been staged for dramatic effect. Where? How did they get access to the kitchen? I seethed, snatching Danny's phone to scrutinize the damning footage closer. I'd bet every penny in the register that Ratfink Trent is behind this, Danny growled, slamming his fist on the prep table. He must have snuck back here after hours to try and manufacture some fake evidence. Made sense. Trent had always been a weaselly little con man, too underhanded to fight fair, always looking for shady shortcuts and loopholes to wriggle through. Smearing my business's reputation through edited video was just his M.O. This is bad, Danny, I mumbled, clicking through more comments on the rapidly going viral post. Look at how many people are just eating this up as gospel truth. Sure enough, a cesspool of outrage and disgust filled the replies. Oh my God, I let my kids eat there. I'm horrified. How is this health hazard of an establishment even allowed to operate? I knew there was something shady about that bitch Marla and her little pity party cafe. That last one caused me to do a double take. My fingers froze on the screen as I reread those hateful, mocking words over and over. There was no mistaking it. The commenter had to be referring to Trent's new squeeze that Lila Skank he had left me for. She was in on this, too. Of course she was. Partner in crime to my rat bastard of an ex in every sense of the word. I felt a towering wave of rage crest over me, blotting out all other thoughts and emotions until a tsunami of pure, unbridled fury crashed over my consciousness. Those backstabbing charlatans thought they could destroy me, turn all the goodwill and support I had so painstaking built into a pile of ash through a few cheap parlor tricks? Well, they had another thing coming. Danny, get the laptop and all the security camera footage you can find, I growled shoving his phone back at him. I don't care how long it takes. I want everything from the last week catalogued and organized for the police. You got it, boss, Danny said grimly, sensing the severity of my tone. In the span of just a few minutes, something had shifted fundamentally inside me. Gone was the fragile emotional vulnerability, the apprehension of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with my devious ex. This was war now, and I was done playing nice. Over the next several hours, Danny and I pored over every second of security tape from various angles around the cafe, both inside and out. Sure enough, we were able to clearly identify Trent and his mistress Lila sneaking in through the back entrance late one night, armed with props to stage their sham exposure video. 
I felt disgusted watching the two degenerates gleefully sow their path of destruction, scattering old onions and moldy potatoes, knocking over shelves to create disarray, even going so far as to deposit droppings clearly smuggled in to create the appearance of an infestation. But feeling my rage boiling over, I also felt a dark sense of vindication fall over me as I gathered up the damning evidence to present to the authorities. Those two scumbags had made their last underhanded move. From here on out, they would face the full consequences of their actions. I wouldn't rest until every last ounce of treachery had been repaid in kind. Justice, however ugly, would be served. Armed with the incontrovertible evidence of Trent and Lila's misdeeds, I immediately filed a report with the local police. Within hours, the dynamic dirtbag duo found themselves under investigation for burglary, defamation, and a laundry list of other charges. But I didn't stop there. If those snakes wanted to try and poison the public against my cafe, I would simply have to swing the pendulum back even harder in my favor. Eva, thank God you're here. I called out as my new best friend hurried through the cafe's front doors the next morning. I need your help spreading the word about a special event. Eva skidded to a stop, eyes wide with concern. What's going on? Is everything okay? Better than okay. It's time to go scorched earth on those toxic exes of ours, I growled, pushing a manila folder brimming with the surveillance photos into her hands. Eva flipped through the incriminating images, lips tightening into a thin line as she took in each new damning shot of Trent and Lila's B&E stunt. When she finally looked back up at me, her expression was one of cold-focused determination. What did you have in mind? Over the next few days, Eva and I went into overdrive promoting an open house and fundraising event at the cafe. We plastered flyers all over town, reserved a prime street for an outdoor dining area, and secured sponsorships from local businesses looking to be part of the community outreach. All the while, our efforts were buoyed by the very public revelation that Trent and Lila were under criminal investigation for their pathetic smear campaign against me. The overwhelmingly negative court of public opinion swung back in my favor like a wrecking ball. The day of the big event arrived, and I have to admit, even I was stunned by the overwhelming turnout. It seemed like the entire town crammed into the cafe and extended patio area, eager to show their solidarity and financial support. I worked the crowd tirelessly, warmly greeting everyone, from frail Mrs. Hendrickson to the snooty Pemberton couples who previously would have viewed my establishment as too lowbrow for their delicate sensibilities. But today, they were all united as one, a tremendous coalition here to champion the businesswoman wronged by her cold-blooded ex and his harlot. Thank you all for coming out and supporting a fabulous local eatery, I proclaimed from my makeshift stage, basking in the energizing roar of applause and cheers. As you all know, my ex-husband Trent and his companion tried to spread vicious lies about the safety and integrity of this cafe. A resonating boo cascaded through the assembled crowd. I couldn't help but smile, relishing how public favor had turned decisively in my court. Spotting a few familiar faces in the, in the back, my smile widened into a grin. But as you can see, the upstanding citizens of this community wouldn't be misled by such underhanded treachery. I crowed to raucous cheers and whistles, and neither would the local authorities. With a dramatic flourish, I gestured to my left, where two police officers entered escorting a handcuffed and visibly rattled Trent and Lila into view. Cameras flashed from every angle, hungrily devouring the image of the disgraced fraudsters being publicly paraded in chains. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the perpetrators responsible for that despicable smear campaign. I announced to a deafeningly chorus of boos and jeers. But have no fear. They're being taken away by the good officers here to face charges of burglary, defamation of character, and a whole host of other fun criminal accusations. Trent's face was a kaleidoscope of swirling emotion, shame, anger, indignation, all flashing across his reddening features in waves. Lila, for her part, looked to be on the verge of hysterics, tears of mascara streaking down her blindingly made-up face. This, this is a mistake. Trent sputtered helplessly, straining against the cuffs as the officers pulled them toward the waiting squad cars. You're making a huge mistake, Marla. I'll ruin you for this, you crazy bye! 
Whatever vile pejorative he'd been prepared to launch at me was immediately drowned out by a resounding torrent of boos, jeers, and catcalls from the assembled crowd, cheering as the sniveling cowards were unceremoniously shoved into the back of separate police cruisers. As the cars peeled away, I felt an overwhelming sense of triumph and validation wash over me. After months of torment and anguish, my cheating jackass of an ex and his vapid arm candy were finally being held accountable. I had won, and they had lost everything. It was the first moment since the nightmare began that I truly felt unshakable, like I had reclaimed my life and identity fully from Trent's despicable grasp. And as I drank in the cheers and applause of my cafe patrons, my friends, my community, I knew there was no force on earth that could tear me down ever again. Not now. Not ever. The aftermath of Trent and Lila's very public downfall was like a sustained victory lap for me. In the weeks and months that followed, I couldn't walk through town without being stopped every few blocks for congratulations or well wishes from enthusiastic supporters. You really showed that dirtbag what for? Cranky old Walter Burns cackled one morning, clapping me heartily on the shoulder as I set out the cafe's sandwich board on the sidewalk. Ain't seen a takedown that sweet since Walter Cronkite put old Tricky Dick in his place. I grinned at the elderly loon's anachronistic praise. Hearing anti-Trent sentiment from every corner of our community never got old, a vindicating affirmation that I had been the wronged party all along in our sordid separation. Inside the cafe, business was booming to the point we could hardly keep up some days. The overwhelming show of support and solidarity on display at the open house fundraiser had catapulted Marla's from a cozy local haunt to the must-visit dining establishment in town. Orders up, triple stack of pancakes with extra butter and maple syrup, Danny called out, sliding a heaping plate across the pass-through to me. I expertly scooped it up for delivery to the steadily growing crowd of hungry patrons along the counter. Morning, Marla. Here's to seeing more of those sleazeballs getting their just desserts. Thomas Landry, my favorite gastroenterologist regular, called out with a wink. He wore an impish grin as he gestured toward the morning news playing on the TV overhead. On the screen was none other than Trent himself, looking pale and despondent as he was perp-walked by officers out of the county courthouse. The Chiron below dutifully listed the numerous charges he'd been convicted of, burglary, criminal trespassing, filing a false police report, and defamation among them. I felt a petty sense of glee watching him slump into the squad car, head in his hands. Well, I'll be, I muttered, shaking my head at his pathetic unraveling. After everything he'd put me through, it was almost hard to derive any satisfaction from seeing him so thoroughly disgraced and ruined. Almost. Should have thought twice before trying to take down this tough cookie, Eva chimed in, squeezing my arm affectionately as she slid onto a stool in front of me. My best friend never missed an opportunity to revel in my regained life and renewed self-confidence. Got that right. I shudder to think where I'd be right now if you all hadn't helped me get my groove back, I said quietly, giving Eva's hand an appreciative pat. Danny suddenly reappeared with a fresh pot of coffee, topping up my mug and those of the other patrons clustered nearby. Are you kidding? He scoffed. You're the one who picked yourself up off the canvas, sis. We just kept you stocked with biscuits and caffeine. A lilting murmur of laughter echoed from our little corner of the cafe. This was my community now, the unshakable backbone that had seen me through my darkest days. A band of brothers and sisters, bound by our shared refusal to be broken by the trauma life had thrown our way. Warriors, every single one of us, just trying to make our way in this crazy world with pride and resilience intact. The TV changed scenes then, displaying new courtroom footage of a visibly distraught and bedraggled Lila being formally sentenced for her role in the crimes against me. The once glossy blonde was a shadow of her formerly sultry self, eyes hollow and hair lank as she was read her punishment, 18 months in county jail plus a hefty fine and community service order. I watched the proceedings impassively, all the venom and bile I'd once felt toward Trent's ill-fated mistress slowly melting away to be replaced by a profound sense of pity? Emptiness? Whatever vacuous force drove these two irredeemable clouts to their sordid actions, I now saw it for the toxic miasma it truly was. 
Vengeance and payback had been my bread and butter for so long, driving me to fight tooth and nail just to reclaim the dignity and identity they had tried so viciously to strip away. But now that the curtain had fallen on their pathetic show, I just felt free, liberated from the chains of their torment once and for all. Well, that's that then, yeah? Eva said with a small smile, giving my hand one last friendly squeeze. Time to put all that ugliness behind us for good, Marla. We got better things to focus on, like getting this place ready for the lunch crowd. As the usual lunchtime commotion began to swell around us, I felt the familiar rush of adrenaline that always preceded the midday crunch. My people needed me, just as I had once so desperately needed them to raise me up from the ashes. With a contented sigh and a warm smile, I tied on my apron and strode forward into the organized chaos, ready to nurture my community in the way only I knew how.